Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Marty Mullet. I'm with Chagrin Valley Astronomical Society. Um, we're going to discuss the history of the telescope tonight. Uh, to do that, we're going to get a little background on telescopes. So without further ado, maybe. There we go. Telescope types. Three main types. Refractors. Two lenses, light goes straight through. Reflector has a mirror at one end. Here you see it on the right hand end. And a compound, or catadioptric, uses a combination of lenses and mirrors. This little mirror here at the end on the top one and on this one, just kind of ignore that. It's called a star diagonal. And it's there for convenience. It's just so you don't lay on your back on the ground if you're looking straight up. Telescopes have two main uh, attributes. One is aperture, just the diameter of the light gathering uh, either mirror or lens of that telescope. Uh, there, that's just what I said. Um, determines how bright or dim an object you can see. The larger the diameter, the more light it gathers, the dimmer the object you can see. It's a function of the surface area in square millimeters or inches. Who knows what the formula is for the area of a circle? Yes? Pi r2. That's a pi r squared. Very good. Pi r squared. So if we have a six inch mirror or lens, we multiply that by pi 3.14. Three squared, three times three is nine. Gives you 28 and a quarter, just about 28 and a quarter square inches. Now with an eight inch, it gets a little bigger. You've almost doubled it by adding two inches. On a 10 inch, you've added almost the equivalent of a, six, a whole six inch mirror by adding two inches. The larger the mirror or the lens gets, the more area, two inches, adds to the total area. And going on, one thing you may notice is from eight to 16, if you double the diameter, you quadruple the area. From 11 to 22, double the diameter, quadruple the area. So the the area goes up much faster than the diameter does. If you ever go to buy one, you'll notice the price goes up even faster than the area. Focal length is the other attribute. The distance from the first, uh, first surface of the lens or the mirror to where the, the light is uh, focused to a point. And, and every one will be a little bit different, but here you see the uh, advantages to a compound telescope by having a lens, a mirror, and another mirror for the light to go through, you've cut the length down three times. Um, if this were a, a 12 inch long telescope, if it wasn't compound, it would be three feet long. Okay, here's how we explain focal length from the first lens down to where the light comes to a point. That's the focal length of the, the primary objective or the primary mirror. It's considered the focal length of the telescope. Their eyepiece that you put in at the other end, here's the focal length of your eyepiece. The focal length of the objective is always capital F, Focal length of the eyepiece is small f. That gives us our focal ratio. Focal length divided by the aperture. Uh, a telescope we have at our uh, observatory has a focal length of 112 inches. It's almost 10 feet long. The diameter is 16 inches. So we divide 112 by 16, we get seven. Our focal ratio is seven that we refer to that as F7. F7 is a good medium 
range um, telescope. The longer the focal ratio, the greater the magnification with the same eyepiece. But it also, the trade-off is a smaller field of view. The key there is the same eyepiece. Here you see like an F7 or an F4. The F4, you notice it has a tighter radius on the mirror. And here's an F7. You can see how you have a, a wider field of view with a, a faster or shorter, shorter focal length is considered a faster telescope. And this is what you get with the same eyepiece. It's a good demonstration of the difference between a long focal length and a short focal length. Magnification. Magnif magnification changes with your eyepiece. The, uh, you take the focal length of the telescope, of, of the objective, divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. That gives you your magnification. So here are the same telescope. We, we convert that to millimeters because our eyepieces are all in millimeters. 2845 divided by 35 gives you a magnification of 81, 81 power. Uh, our, some of our other eyepieces that we use a lot of, 44 millimeter gives you 65 power. 12 millimeter gives you 237 power. That doesn't sound like a lot, it is a lot. Um, on this telescope, well, we'll get to that. Theoretical maximum of any telescope is 50 times the aperture in inches. So a 16 inch telescope, theoretical maximum is 800 power. I have a 10 inch telescope at home, the theoretical maximum is 500. However, and this is the big however, the realistic maximum is usually less than half of that. So when you go to Target or Walmart and you see a little telescope on the counter and it says 1500 power, they're lying to you. You can put an eyepiece in to give you 1500 power and it will never focus. Yes? Yeah, I remember my, my little brother, he won this thing at the library and he got this telescope like this big and he was so excited because he had all these pictures of seeing planets. He was freaking out. Yeah, no, it showed you the same thing as your eye. Right. We, we, looked at, we looked at the moon and it, I was like, I'm looking at that with both my eyes and I'm seeing the same thing. Yeah, most of those <laughs> cheap, what we call them dime store telescopes, yep. are, are just that. I mean, they're, they're more toys than they are instruments. Okay, let's talk about first lenses and refractors. I have some lenses here to pass around. This is a convex lens. It, bulges out. You'll notice one size bulges a little more than the other. Here's one that's half flat, half convex. And here's one that's flat on one side and concave on the other. Do try not to drop them. Here's the lens types we find in telescopes. Biconvex, plano convex, plano concave, and concave. These are converging, those are diverging. By that we mean if it's convex, it, it bends the light rays together. The light rays all converge at one point. That point is the focal length. If it's concave, it spreads them out. You have diverging light rays. If you trace them all backwards to where they come to a point, that's the focal length of a concave eyepiece. Since it's to the left, it's the direction that light's coming in, it's always a negative number. A concave eyepiece has a negative focal length. A convex eyepiece has a positive focal length. How much does it bend? That's where we come up with Snell's Law. The law of refraction, it looks a lot more difficult than it is. Uh, N is the refractive index, the velocity change of the speed of light through any transparent material. Uh, it was first discovered, Ibn Sal, in Baghdad in 984 AD, 
was the first one to discover this. Uh, it was discovered independently. Thomas Harriot, we'll get to him later, in 1602. And then Willebrord Snellius was a uh, Dutch scientist. Uh, he published it. He was the first one to publish it, so that's why it's named for him. C, the speed of light. 186,000 miles per second. Pretty fast. That's in air. In water, it slows down. 139,850 miles per second. In glass, it practically crawls. 122,350 miles per second. That's our refractive index. That determines how much light refracts when it passes from one substance into another, from air into glass, from air into water. Here, we, we have to do a little bit of math. You have a light ray coming in at a certain angle. It hits the boundary between air and glass, and it will refract. So that angle off of 90 degrees up on top there you see theta, theta 1, theta 2 is down here. We want to know what theta 2 is after we know what theta 1 is. So we say the top one is 30 degrees. Just pick an arbitrary number. So we know that N1, which is our top substance, times the sine of 30 degrees is equal to N2 times the sine of theta 2. Well, the sine of 30 degrees is half, one half. We know N1 is air, so that's 1. So we have 1 times half is equal to 1.52 times the sine of that angle. 1 times a half is a half. It's equal to 1.52 times the sine of that angle. Divide both sides by 1.52. Uh, this is just basic algebra. And you get 0.3289, roughly a third, but we'll, we'll keep it down to four places. That equals the sine of theta 2. That's our angle. How do we find just theta 2? We use inverse sines. Does anybody know how to use an inverse sine in their head? That's why we have calculator. <laughs> calculator is your friend. Um, hit the inverse button, the sign button, and it gives you your answer. 19.2 degrees. So we know that's 19.2 degrees. That's the amount light has refracted entering glass. If we say this is a window, well, it's going to refract again because we have another change. We have a surface there. We have another change in material. So how do we find this? Well, if these two lines are parallel, the dotted lines are parallel, if the left angle is 19.2, what's the right angle going to be? Anybody know? Yes. 19.2. Good answer. If the pair of those are what? Complementary angles, I believe they're called? Okay, alternate interior angles. Anyway, they're the same. So we know if that's the same up there, we just do all our calculations in reverse, and that tells us down here that this must be 30 degrees. Thank you. So the light that when it hits the glass, it takes a little jog, but then it leaves on a parallel path. It's heading in the same direction, it's just moved over a little bit. But for our purposes here, this is what we run into with lenses. When the two surfaces are not parallel, so the light comes in, we know it would have hit 19.2 off the top um, angle off the top surface, but unless we know this bottom surface here, we don't know what those angles are off of this line. 
And if this is curved, if the bottom line is curved, we need to know what the angle is at that exact point. Because as that point moves, the angle will change. I tried to calculate that with a curved uh, surface there, and it just made my brain hurt. So we stopped. However, if you come in at 90 degrees, your angle theta up on top there is zero because you're at the 90 degree angle. You're right on top of it. So there is no difference. So if you, to do the calculations, if the angle is zero, the sine of zero is zero. Anything you multiply by zero is zero. And if the left-hand side of the equation is zero, the right-hand side of the equation must be zero. zero. Very good. Okay, done with the dry stuff. Reading stones. The first lenses um, that we found in history were the ancient Egyptians. Up on top there, those are actual reading stones that we found in tombs in ancient Egypt. This one on the bottom was the ancient Greeks, about 500 BC. It is so perfect, you'd be hard pressed to make a more accurate uh, biconvex or uh, plano convex lens with a modern day CNC machine. These were, were very common. Um, there's all kinds of literature about them from the, from the people who used them. They also used what they called burning glass. This is the Visby stone. It was found in 11th century Swedish tomb uh, from a Viking. Um, it's believed to have come from Persia or somewhere in the Middle East. It's glass. The green color is because the silica had iron contamination in it. But we found that when you put light through it, it all focuses to a point. You could use it for starting fires. You could also use it, more importantly, if you're a Viking warrior, you could cauterize your wounds with this glass which doesn't sound like fun, but it definitely improves your chances of survival. The, uh, our knowledge of optics really starts with the Assyrians. Uh, in the 800s BC, uh, they worked a lot with, uh, did the groundwork for Ibn Sal, later with his um, Snell's Law. They show no records of ever having a telescope. However, they knew that Saturn had rings, and they knew that Saturn had seven major moons. And there's no way of knowing that without a telescope. So we don't know why there's no record of it, but the common thought is they must have had something to help them discover that with Saturn. Uh, as time went on, our optics, uh, advances in optics, Ibn Sal uh, in Baghdad, he wrote about the properties of convex, plano convex lenses, parabolic and elliptical mirrors. The, uh, the mathematics for this was known to the Greeks, um, but he was able to graph it all out, the refractive and reflective qualities of, of all of those. Uh, his work was carried on by Ibn el Haytham uh, in Cairo. He's considered the father, father of modern optics. He, uh, more, uh, he, he made more advances on Snell's law from what Ibn Sal had. But this, all this information, once it was in the Arab empire, it was only a matter of time till it got to Spain, crossed the border into France, and became common knowledge in Europe. We also had to wait for technological advances. In Florence, Italy, there was a major industry grinding lenses. Uh, they developed a machine to grind multiple lenses all at the same time, all with the same curve. Um, but their lens grinding was a back and forth me method. 
uh, until the continuous rotation lathe was invented, where all you had to do was have your servant stand there and, and turn a crank for 14 hours a day, you could grind, uh, you could grind faster and stronger, so you could start grinding glass and metal. Before that time, uh, grinding glass was, was a very cumbersome, labor-intensive process. Men with lenses, Robert Grosstest and Roger Bacon, um, Roger Bacon knew of Robert Grosstest, they both wrote about using multiple lenses, and I think the word they use is see objects at incredible distances. Leonardo da Vinci and Della Porta both used and wrote about using lenses to view the moon. Now, there's 150 years here and another 100 years there, um, actually 250 years and another 100 years there. These aren't the only four men to hold a lens up and look somewhere. They're the only four we know of that wrote about it. Uh, but obviously in that amount of time, several people must have used it. In 1609, somebody finally put two lenses in one tube and made a telescope. Who was that? Take your pick. Hans Lippershey was the first one to, he generally gets credit for it, he was the first one to apply for a patent in the Netherlands for his telescope. Two weeks after he applied, Jacob Medius went to the patent office to apply for a patent for his telescope that he invented. Not long after that, Zacharias Jansen showed up saying that Hans's telescope is really my telescope. He stole my plans. So in the end, nobody got the patent. Uh, Hans got the, uh, an award and a contract to make more of them, but nobody got the patent. And what they didn't realize was Juan Roger, who was a Frenchman living in Spain, in 1593 bequeathed to his wife a telescope decorated in brass for a long sight. So obviously in Spain they had them 20 years before anybody knew about it in, in the Netherlands. This, it's called a Galilean refractor. This is the, the type of telescope that everybody invented in the Netherlands. Um, you have a, conve a convex lens at this end. The eyes over here, you have a concave lens. It would take an object and make it bigger, make it seem closer, and kept it upright. The, uh, the biggest demand for these was for military or naval use. So you wanted an upright image. There were very few astronomers, and if you made five of them for astronomers, you'd probably flood the market. But armies always wanted telescopes. Two gentlemen, Thomas Harriet, Galileo, both heard about the invention in the Netherlands, both designed their own telescope, both came up with a 20 power, much improved telescope, and both used their telescope to look at the moon. Everybody knows Galileo was the first person to aim his telescope into the sky. The problem with that is, no, he wasn't. Thomas Harriet, we just discovered this in the 1980s, they found his notes. In August of 1609, he looked at the moon and made sketches of it. Galileo didn't do anything until November. Galileo published his right away, that's why he got the credit. Harriet never published his. Johannes Kepler, who we'll learn more about him later, he gave us the three laws of planetary motion. Uh, he was an astronomer and a scientist. He discovered if you took a telescope, put a convex lens at both ends, lengthened it so that if you were past the focal length, it would flip your image upside down, but if you're looking at the sky, that doesn't matter. A star is a star whether it's right side up or upside down. The advantage he found there 
well, we'll get to it. He uh, designed it in 1611. Christoph Scheiner, uh, a German scientist, built the first Kepler and telescope. This was the basis for the next 250 years, this was the basis of refracting telescopes. Galileo's idea and his invention more or less died with him and the Keplerian took over. Uh, Shiner in the meantime was inventing the equatorial mount whereas the, uh, the axis you see going from lower right to upper left if you align that with the Earth's axis, you can follow an object in the sky only moving uh, one set of coordinates. Here was the advantage to the Keplerian telescope. Uh, Galilean, very small field of view, very dim. Kepler's was much, much larger, much brighter. It was upside down, but looking at the moon, who cares? What they found is, with your objective lens, light doesn't bend equally. All wavelengths don't bend the same. So here, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but if you draw a line right through the middle, that's the best focus, but it's not exact. That's called chromatic aberration. And if you have just one lens, there's no way of avoiding that. This is what it looks like. Since the, the colors aren't all bending equally, so you have an excess of yellow at one side, blue on the other. Christian Huygens, uh, another prominent scientist, in the late 1660s, we don't know exactly when, he invented the Huygens eyepiece, where he adds two plano convex lenses down beyond, I mean the objective lens is way over here, down at the end he found that he had to work at the, getting the spacing right and the focal length of the eyepieces. But by doing this he could eliminate chromatic aberration in very long focal lengths. What do we mean by very long? Uh, F-296. This is a eight and a half inch lens up on the top there on a 120 foot rope. So you would stand at the bottom, pull the rope tight, aim at what you're looking for, line up your two sticks that are connected by the rope, and you could view what you wanted to view. Uh, naturally it was cumbersome, it didn't work well, yes? And you got a picture, it took a while to set up too. Well yeah, the, <laughs> <laughs> to get a picture, yes. So that's about the, the limit to the advances of refractors in the 1600s. Let's talk about mirrors and reflectors next. Here I have a, a mirror, a 12 inch mirror. Um, I'm not gonna pass it around because it weighs about <laughs> 40 pounds. Um, but if you wanna come up afterwards and look at it, it's, it's uh, concave, parabolic shape. This was Archimedes who lived in, on uh, the island of Sicily, he lived in Syracuse, and legend has it that he polished brass parabolic mirrors, and when the Roman fleet was coming to invade Syracuse, he would shine the mirrors, or use the mirrors to direct the sunlight, focus it to the point, and he burnt the Roman fleet. Um, a few issues with that, number one, you're in a boat surrounded by water, and two, it has a focal point. All the light coming has a focal point. So if the focal point is on your boat, all you have to do is move forward or back, and now it's just a bright light. <laughs> uh, but anyway, legend has it that that's uh, how he uh, thwarted the Roman invasion. We will say that we still light the Olympic torch every two years off a parabolic mirror oh, on Mount Olympus in Greece. So they still use the sun to light the Olympic torch. To make mirrors, they needed a substance to do it with. What they found is, this is called speculum metal. 
two thirds copper, one third tin. It was white in color, very hard, very brittle. If you dropped it, it would shatter. Uh, but it would reflect two thirds of the light that hit it. But it's two thirds per mirror, 66% per mirror. So with a reflector, you have two mirrors. The first one would give you 66% of the light. The second one would give you 66% of that light. So by the time it, the light got to your eye, you were at about 40%. Um, they're very prone to frequent tarnishing. You were lucky to get three or four months out of them. And then to clean them, you had to remove the surface. So now you had to repolish it to a, a new parabolic shape. The bottom line was you needed two sets of mirrors or you'd only use your telescope half the time. And it was thermally unstable. As the nights got cold, it would shrink, it would change its shape, and you would lose your focus. Here is a polished speculum metal mirror. Um, really not all that impressive, but that's what they had. And with a mirror, you could avoid that chromatic aberration. Uh, now mirrors come in several curvatures. Uh, people have been playing with, with the different curves all along. Uh, parabolic and hyperbolic are the most, most common ones now. Uh, a spherical mirror, you see here, doesn't reflect all the light to one area. You have a very long focal plane, not a focal point. The parabolic surface goes to a focal point. And in very long uh, focal lengths, this <coughs> spherical surface will approach what you would get with a parabolic surface. Above F15, it's hard to tell the difference. And here's where we, we come along with Nicholas Niccolo Zucchi, an Italian monk in 1616, took a, a brass parabolic mirror and a concave eyepiece, and he held the eyepiece in front of the telescope and tried to look at the image. The problem he ran into is if you hold it right at the focal plane, your head blocks the tube, so you don't see anything. So if you move it off to the side, now you're out of the focal plane and you have a blurry image. Well, he tried that for a little while, got nowhere, and gave it up. But he was the first one to combine a mirror and a lens. Following him was Marine Mersain in France, 1636, he was decades ahead of his time. He designed what we'll find out later was a Gregorian and a Cassegrainian telescope, but he couldn't find an optician to grind the curves in the metal. Uh, these are all parabolic and hyperbolic curves, and no one had the ability to grind those into a mirror at that time. James Gregory and Isaac Newton were both English scientists. Uh, they knew each other, they worked together a lot. They worked on reflecting telescopes and mirrors. Gregory designed a, uh, a compound telescope, a uh, concave ellipsoidal secondary mirror up here. The advantage this one has is it kept everything right side up. So you could still sell it to the Navy and the armies. There was a bigger market for them. Um, always remember that these are commercial endeavors. People are inventing things, but they're more than willing to make money at it. And uh, sometimes that's the primary factor. But uh, same thing with a Gregorian reflector. He couldn't build it. He couldn't find an optician to grind the curves. So he just left it. Whereas Newton, Newton uh, ground his, he tried to grind a parabolic mirror. He couldn't do it. So he ended up uh, just sticking with a spherical mirror. Those are much easier to grind. And he made the first functional reflecting telescope. 1668, this is the one he gave to the uh, Royal Society in, in Britain. It wasn't Impressive, it didn't give as good of views as a uh, refractor of the day, but it was the, the first one without chromatic aberration. 
Right behind him, Laurent Cassegrain. Uh, we don't know what he looked like. There's no portraits of him. So I thought he must have red curly hair and a goatee. <laughs> we don't even know that Laurent was his first name. Uh, he's probably made the greatest advances in telescopes since uh, Galileo, and we know so little about him. But he designed the Cassegrainian reflector. Uh, hyperbolic secondary mirror, parabolic primary mirror. This mirror, or this telescope, is what we have at Observatory Park, the 36 inch Cassegrain reflector. This design, or a derivative of this design, is the basis of every major research telescope in the world today, is some form of a Cassegrainian telescope. So having said that, I will say thank you for your attention. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, uh, let's, uh, we have a little project for you. We can turn some lights on. Um, we're going to build our own telescope here. And it may look very simple, um, elementary. But the telescope we're going to build is the exact size that Galileo had. The same size and the same power. It's about a 20 power telescope. And this is the telescope he used when he discovered the moons of Jupiter and the rings of Saturn. So I was hoping we could use them tonight. We can't because uh, it's cloudy. But at some time in the future, uh, take it out. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are both out in the southwest in the evening. Um, take a look and discover how difficult it really is to hold a telescope in your hand and look at anything, let alone see what you're looking at. Oh, okay, before we start, wait, I need everybody's attention here. Uh, everybody look at me, raise your right hand. Everybody raise your right hand. And repeat after me, I promise, I promise to never, to never ever, 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 ever look at the sun, at the sun. With, my with my telescope. Ever. Ever. Okay, thank you. Never, ever, ever, ever. It's, it's powerful enough that you'll damage your eye looking at the sun. It'll be instant, permanent, you won't get a second chance. So bear that in mind. Okay, if you want to take your two uh, orange caps apart, And with the larger of the two, when you get that big lens, unwrap your big lens. Be careful, don't rub it on your table because it'll scratch. Okay, set it, set it down and, and the side you want down, it will be able to rock. You want the convex side down. One side is curved, the other side is flat. So if it lays flat, you'll know it's flat. If it rocks, that's the curved side, okay? Stick it in the large cap, the curved side first. In the big one, in the big cap. Take your, yeah, take the two caps apart. Yeah. And then put the, the curved side goes in first. Then, then take your tubes, and it, and it may be difficult at first, spread your tubes apart a little bit. Not all the way. Beg your pardon? 
the lenses, they'll be flat on one side, not on the other. You have to lay it down, lay it on the table here. And see how that rocks? Yeah. And here it doesn't? Uh -huh. So this is the, the curved side. Yeah. That so goes in first. Side you put in. Okay. Yep. Okay, everybody got their lens in the cap? <laughs> yeah, it goes all the way to the end of the, of the large cap. You have the right cap. Yeah, it'll fit. You'll, you'll get one. It's a lens. Lens. Why do I keep it too Yes. Correct. Curved side goes down. Just like that. And then you put it on the large tube that goes on the end of the large tube. It's easier sometimes to just lay your cap on the table and push the tube onto it. Just like that. Yes, very good. Got that? On the large end of the, the larger tube. Okay, everybody with me. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it goes on the bottom. <laughs> yes. I can back up a step. Okay. You have the uh, your sponge, your black sponge. Set it on the table. Take your little tiny cardboard tube. The very no, the very tiny piece there. This. Yeah. And push that all the way to the bottom of your. Uh, push this to the bottom of that hole. Oh no, this, you want this on the table. Oh. Okay. Okay, do you have a little cardboard too? Oh, it's already in there. Okay. Oh, it's alright. Uh, that looks pretty good. Let me check. Yeah, there we go. Now take, set your, um, your small cap on the table, put the cardboard, the little cardboard disc in it, in your small cap, doesn't matter. Okay, set, put your, your cardboard disc in your small cap. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Either side. Okay. Now take your your telescope tubes, the small end out, over your black foam rubber. So when you look at your foam rubber, you see the cardboard, the little tiny cardboard tube right here at the end. Just like that. Yep. 
Everybody got that? And then put your whole tube over the cap that has the cardboard disc in it. Doesn't, doesn't matter. When did this come in to this way? Oh, you put that right? Yeah, we skipped that. Did you? Okay. <laughs> so where, at what point does that go in? Right after the uh, little cardboard tube. Okay, you have your... Yeah, push that all the way down, then put your lens in. And have it down tight against the cardboard. That's right, and then the little tube on that, and then right on there. Beg your pardon? Yes, you will. Oh, uh, you're, you might, you're way too close here. Uh, and plus, you'll focus. Folks, when you take it out, you can use it for terrestrial viewing. Uh, you focus it by sliding your tubes back and forth. So, what's, if you want to do bird watching. Yes, it'll be upside down. But you'll find looking at the sky, what, what a lot of people do is, if you go out and look at Saturn uh, the next clear night, which is probably April, um, find the focus for a stars or planets and draw a line around your little tube so you'll know next time you go out that's focused for space. Well, it won't focus in here because everything's way too close. And that's the end you want to look in. The little, the end with the little hole is the end you look in. That way. There you go. It, it could be out of focus. You got to slide this back and forth, and it could be, uh, you know, very. I'm very close here, so. That's the same, <coughs> yes, this, the difference between this telescope and Galileo's telescope, the biggest difference is your optics are a thousand times better than his. But it's pretty much the same view, the same telescope that he used. His wasn't paper. No, his wasn't paper. But his glass was full of ripples and air bubbles and curves and... Uh, these cheap little plastic lenses are, are much, much better than anything you could dream of. Are we all set? Yes. What are the focal lengths? What are the focal lengths? It's an afocal telescope. It doesn't have a focal length because the light never goes to a point. Yes, I can. I'll be looking at it. No, I think, uh, would you just put it down and see if it rocks? Yeah, it rocks. Yeah. So that's right. Yeah. That goes in here. Okay. That goes in here. Okay. And you got that in here. Yeah. Pretty sure I got that right. Yep. Oh, yeah. Right about there focuses the far wall. Okay, everybody all set? Yep, it works great. The mirror's up here if somebody wants to look at it before you go. Uh, thank you for your attention. You've got a wonderful audience. Next month, December 9th, we'll be at Observatory Park. We, um, if, uh, we'll have a little planetarium show there. If the weather cooperates, we'll do some viewing, uh, hopefully out of the 36-inch telescope. Awesome. Uh, Sue, do you have something?
that organizer Heidi has put all of the past videos on YouTube. Oh, good. And so you can go there anytime, and it's under Sky Watchers. So go on YouTube, look up Sky Watchers, and you can look at all the past programs that oh, we've good. had. And we'll also have it again at Observatory Park. Okay. Oh yes. oh, yes. Parents that would like to get involved to help us with. For the record, I was supposed to mention this at the beginning. And so, if you're interested in helping us out, and we're very excited to have you here, thank you so much for coming, and we hope to see you. Whoops. You dropped your microphone. Thank you. No problem. These are awesome. Thanks a lot. This is, a, this is going to be very fun to look at. It works great, too.